Hey, welcome to UK Worldcraft. So I'm just taking a foraging walk along the Severn estuary. Now the Severn is a tidal estuary, so I've got both coastal and some estuary plants growing here as well. And we're in January, so there might not be quite as much as normal, but let's take a look at what we can find. This is rock samphire a nice edible member of the carrot family, the Apiaceae family. Now when you forage any member of the carrot family, you do have to be very careful because there are some deadly members of that family. But saying that, this is one of the easier ones to identify from the carrot family. Now I'm taking this walk in January and you don't always find this plant in the UK during the winter but in milder winters like we're having this year you do often get a flush around January time. Rock samphire is a coastal plant and it grows on rocks and cliffs all around the coast and it's often in areas that are quite difficult to reach and it always grows above the high tide line. A nice easy way to find it in winter and spring is to look for these, the dried out dead flower heads from last season. And you see they're quite distinctive looking and they're sticking up out of the rocks. And you just follow those down and you'll find the fresh growth growing at the base. Here's a nice patch of it here. So it has quite a nice mild carroty flavour and a little bit salty. I like to eat them in stir fries. Uh, it also works really well pickled and served with fish. It's full of omega oils and it's high in vitamin C. I recommend uh, if you cook it, not to cook it for too long and not at a high temperature because that does destroy the vitamin C content. Uh, it doesn't taste like marsh samphire, and two plants aren't related. There's not really much you can mistake rock samphire for, especially with its location of clinging to coastal rocks. Apart from this plant here actually, which is buckthorn plantain. I'll talk to you about that in a bit. That is also edible as well. There's another one there, buckthorn plantain. So the, the leaves of rock samphire are green and succulent and they separate to look a bit like antlers. If you break a leaf and crush it and smell it, you'll get a bit of a, a smell mixed between carrot and aniseed. Not a bad view to be picking your dinner. Better than Tesco anyway. As you can see, this plant here is in flower, which for January is quite unusual, but handy for this video. So you can see here that this really is a member of the carrot or apiaceae family because it has humble clusters, like umbrella-like clusters of flowers. When these flowers open, they'll have five petals each, which will be green or going towards yellow. And you can see behind the flowers, you've got quite distinctive looking bracts, those pointed leaves. And also where the umbel meets the stem, you've got bracts there as well. They're quite densely packed umbels. You can eat these as well, by the way, the, uh, the flower heads. 
they're quite tasty and the seeds as well when they form just one little extra note be quite careful when you're harvesting it just pick it fairly gently because you don't want to go uprooting the whole plant because it's just rooted into the rock sometimes they're quite weakly rooted so yeah just be quite careful or even just snip them off with scissors so these plants here are sea radish all parts of this plant are edible and it can be found all year round it's a biennial in its first year it will form a densely packed rosette and in its second year like this one it will grow flower spikes like this with cruciform fl flowers this is a member of the brassica or mustard family and they all have flowers with four petals in a cross so they're cruciform flowers so the leaves usually grow to about 30 centimeters though I've seen them grow quite a lot bigger than that and they're divided and the divisions go all the way back to the midrib now the leaves are very rough in texture I generally don't eat the leaves of the second year plants they're a bit tougher not as nice a flavour I usually find the basal rosettes of the first year leaves but as I said you can eat all parts of this plant you can eat the flowers my favourite part is uh, after the flowers have disappeared the seed pods come out and you can uh, eat those they're really nice pickled uh, you can also eat the root of this plant though you do need permission to uproot it it's uh, fairly similar to the cultivated type of radish but not as good in my opinion they're usually a bit tougher and not as nice a flavor so I wouldn't bother with those anyway to be honest uh, it's just the yeah the young leaves which are good in winter and spring and then the the flowers and seed pods uh, these are very early in January they're usually like uh, late spring so these are the sort of younger leaves you want to be going for they're a bit lighter green and the the lobes are often like quite overlapped so I just use these in place of cabbage they've got a nice mild sort of cabbagey mustard flavor and yeah available all winter so the only plants you might mistake sea radish for are other members of the brassica family and conveniently here's one right next to the sea radish this is wild mustard or charlock and uh, it's not really easy to identify when it's not in flower so I'll do a video later in the year on this plant but um, yeah these are edible too
So these are the plants I mentioned earlier. This is buckshorn plantain. These are quite young ones. The leaves do grow to about 12 centimeters or more on a more mature plant. And you see the leaves grow in a nice clear basil rosette. Now the leaves are lobed and look like uh, deer's antlers. And you'll see they've got really fine hairs growing along the edge of the leaves. A good way to identify the plant, uh, that it doesn't have the feature now, but in late spring when it starts to flower, the flower stems will grow out horizontally until they reach the edge of the rosette and then they'll start to grow vertically. So they go out and then curve up but that won't be until, yeah, about late spring. So the leaves are quite succulent and uh, they've got quite a nice, mild, pleasant flavor like parsley, but with a bit of a, a salty flavor as well. I look, quite like to just um, nibble on these raw as I'm walking around, but you can also just add them into salads. If you cut them just at the base, you can just take the rosette quite easily. And I think they look quite nice just as a, a garnish. And as long as you don't uproot them, they grow back. There's some more mature ones down in this little cove. Obviously a bit more sheltered here, so let's do a quick look. Yeah, these look quite nice there. So this plant grows pretty much all around the UK coastline. It can be grown out of rocks or near the dunes. You do occasionally get it inland in fields, but much more common around the coast. It's a very medicinal plant this. Like uh, the other plantains, they do have quite a lot of medicinal uses. And here's one I can pretty much guarantee I'll find every time I go foraging by the coast or estuaries. This is sea beet. And this is one of my favorite wild plants. It's a really good one to learn as a forager because it's a good source of greens that you can pick all year. This plant is the wild ancestor of spinach and beetroot. In my opinion it's much better than spinach because the the leaves don't wilt down when they're cooked and they've got a nice irony flavour. And in April you get the flower spikes come up and they are probably my number one wild food. They're really tasty. They're really nice just steamed and then fried in a bit of butter. But like I said it's a really handy plant to know because you can harvest it all year round. So it's a really good source of greens in the winter. The leaves are dark green and glossy and they've got a wavy margin or wavy edge. Even more so on the larger leaves. A really important ID feature for sea beet is that they have really long petioles or leaf stems see they're really long and also the the leaves are decurrent which means they grow down the stem so it looks like they've got wings at the top I 
So I always take the stems as well when I'm picking the leaves because they're quite nice and succulent. The sea bee is abundant all around the UK coast, though apparently not quite so much in northern Scotland. And it'll be growing in like the sand dunes, in shingle, or just in like field edges near to the coast or in tidal estuaries. So when I was saying about the carrot or apiaceae family, you have to be quite careful. This plant here is one of the main reasons why. This is hemlock water dropwort, and this is a deadly poisonous plant. So much so that probably just a amount like that or a, a few sprigs would be enough to kill most people. So be very careful of this plant, especially if you're foraging in damp environments like this then uh, this plant is actually very common and I think one of the main problems is it looks fairly edible um, it looks just kind of like wild celery really so it's this is one of the plants that people are most at risk of so get to learn the the leaf structure if you don't know how to identify this plant definitely then I would stay away from the Apiaceae family altogether. If you see the leaves each section has got like a roughly triangular shape and the leaves are fairly broad look a bit like flat leaf parsley and they have toothed margins. Later in the year it will send up Umbels of white flowers with five petals. Uh, like all Apiaceae, they have um, five petals in umbels of flowers. Uh, the flower stems are hollow on hemlock water dropwort and they're, hem they're hairless and they're grooved. But the, the petioles, the leaf stems, are not hollow. So, this is the other member of the Apiaceae family that you uh, have to be really careful of when you're foraging. This is poison hemlock. There's quite a few members of the Apiaceae family that look almost identical to this, like chervil. The leaves and the leaf structure are very, very similar. So I'd say don't eat any plants like that until you can identify this plant 100%. Um, I have done a video on telling uh, the difference between poison hemlock and chervil, but I actually just say I recommend not to eat uh, wild chervil or cow parsley at all because it's not that great a tasting plant in my opinion and the, the risk versus the reward just isn't worth it. But this plant, the stems, the, uh, the leaf stems, the petioles, they don't have a groove running down it like chervil does. They're perfectly rounded and they're smooth and waxy. They don't have any hairs on them. And they often have red flecking on the stem. It looks like someone's flicked red paint onto the stem, but these don't really have it yet because they're quite young plants. It doesn't really happen until they start to mature. And something else is if you get the uh, one of the stems 
or you crush the leaves and smell it, they've got a really unpleasant smell. If you've ever had any um, like hamsters or gerbils, uh, it's basically the smell of the, uh, the bottom of the cage, you know, all the sawdust. It's a really unpleasant, musky smell. So yeah, another plant to be very aware of if you're a forager, poison hemlock. These are the basil leaves of mullen. Now these are very small at the moment because it's a very young plant. They do grow quite a lot bigger than this. And I believe this is the flower spike from last year's growth. Uh, they usually grow quite a lot bigger than this, even like up to two meters. So this one's very small, which I imagine is because it's growing mostly on bare rock with a small amount of soil. So not enough um, depth to get the, the roots down to make a bigger plant. Uh, this is an edible plant, though I wouldn't eat it in this stage. Uh, these leaves, when they're very young, they're almost like felt. They're uh, really soft. And um, yeah, if the shops ever run out of toilet paper again, these are really good. <laughs> um, yeah, this is more of a medicinal plant than edible. So part of winter foraging is just come to see what's starting to grow and then knowing what you can come and get in later seasons. So I know that these will produce the flowers because there's flower spikes here. Uh, and these are really good for like sore throats. You can make a cough syrup out of the flowers. So I might do a video on that. I'll come back later in the year and collect some of the flowers.